So then um, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, as we talked about, this is week five of the Soil Fertility Series, which is great. And I will let Colleen take it from here. All right. Thanks so much, Emily. So yeah, this is the fifth of seven weeks. I hope if you have questions, you'll feel very free to ask them in chat. It's not a huge group. And again, awesome. if you don't want to ask them to everyone, just uh, find my name in the chat list over on the right-hand side, and uh, you can send it just to me or just to Emily, and we'll go from there. If you have a question afterwards, always feel free to give me a call about anything soil fertility related or send me an email. On February 1st, just a couple days ago, Hayes Goosey became MSU's new extension forage specialist. Since uh, those of you who are listening in today are obviously interested in forages, I wanted to give a big shout out to Hayes and uh, see if Hayes wants to maybe just say a few words about himself. Sure, Clayton. Uh, can everybody hear me? Great. Yeah, I can. Yeah. Appreciate uh, appreciate the introduction. Appreciate the opportunity to sit in. So, just a little bit about myself. Uh, maybe about the last 15 years, I've spent a lot of time in integrated crop livestock systems, uh, looking at alternative forage systems. But I've also spent a fair amount of time in more traditional, you know, the annual spring and winter wheat and alfalfa uh, uh, forage production systems. So, getting up and going here this spring, uh, we'll try to get some sandfoin variety trials started, along with some Alfalfa variety trials, we'll see if we can get some of those in this spring, but definitely get a few sandfoin uh, cultivars seeded. Sandfoin's becoming a, a definitely a, a crop of interest. And so uh, just kind of a general overall focus uh, on forage production above and below ground. And so I appreciate the opportunity to sit in here today and learn some things about the below ground aspect. And you can see my contact information on the screen. I'm open for phone calls or emails. And so with that, uh, Clay, appreciate it. I'll turn it back over to you. All right, thanks, Hayes. So yeah, anything soil fertility related with forages, uh, talk to me. Anything else, insects, disease, anything forage, agronomy, talk to Hayes, and if it gets more specific, he will send you on to someone else. So a big question when you're at a forage talk, why should you learn about soils? Can everyone make sure they um, mute their microphone? I'm hearing just a little feedback. Why learn about soils? Of course, soils is where the roots are, and that's where uh, you're going to get good forage yield from. Also, understanding soil should help you efficiently use your resources, meaning water, fertilizer, and your dollars, and also for good conservation. So my goals today are to show nutrient deficiency symptoms of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and sulfur review the use of fertilizer guidelines to help you determine fertilizer rates, present the timing, source, and placement considerations for fertilizer on forage crops, and also illustrate yield and quality responses of hay to nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and sulfur, and then really help your bottom line. So some questions for you that will help me understand you guys a, a little bit better, like where, you know, what you raise, how many of you really um, are, are growing uh, these different hay crops. So what I'm going to do is, what I would like you to do is tell me who has raised alfalfa hay or grass hay. If, and this is good practice for using the chat. Type a big Y, type a Y if you have. Type an N if you haven't, and I'll just get a flavor for who my audience is. Seeing a lot of Ys and yeses. Let's see a place I can type. Paul, can you mute your um, microphone? The chat should be over on the right hand side. If you can't see it, um, there's uh, it should be over in the lower right hand corner. Uh, the X or uh, there's a chat. There's a little chat box that's in the right hand corner. And then can you mute your uh, is that microphone? It? Is that it? Um, I don't know if you're I don't know if you're. Um, on there or not. 
So if anybody's having trouble, if for some reason that chat box, that space to type is not there, there should be a little like chat speech bubble that's either in the bottom right hand corner or in the middle of your screen. If you click on that, it should bring up that option for you to type in an answer. Thanks, Emily. All right. It looks like most people are yeses and a few are no. How about who has pasture, who either manages pasture or owns pasture? A lot of yeses, great. And then the third question, how about annual forages? Who has grown annual forages? So these would be things like hay barley, hay bet barley, um, Will Creek winter, Creek winter wheat, all of these cereal annual forages. Some no's, some yeses, more no's it looks like. Yep, so I think I think the perennial forages are still king and queen in, in Montana. Thank you, that helps. Uh, a lot. So to get the most out of your fertilizer investment, what do you need to think about? And the fertilizer industry talks about the four R. So applying the right rate, the right fertilizer source, the right timing of that fertilizer, the right placement. And then I like to add a fifth R, which is right rotation, because that's so important at using your fertilizer efficiently. So when you're growing hay, you really need to think about what nutrients do you want to focus on? It's hard thinking about all 14 nutrients or maybe even the three major nutrients, but you can really narrow that down by thinking what kind of forage are you growing? So what this table or figure is trying to do is point out that you could have a large range of grass and legume. So there's a lot of alfalfa grass mixtures in Montana. You could have 100% grass and 0% legume. Maybe you have 50-50, or you might be growing no grass and 100% legume. Well, if you are mainly growing grass, or you have, say, an old alfalfa grass stand that's become grass and maybe some weeds, you really want to manage this as a pure grass stand. And what that means is really focus on nitrogen. The legumes probably aren't going to provide very much nitrogen. Conversely, if you mainly have legumes, so say mainly alfalfa or mainly sandfoin or clover in that stand, you want to manage it as a pure legume stand. And what that means is really focus on phosphorus and potassium which are needed in much higher quantities in legumes because the bacteria on their roots, like we've talked about previous weeks, is going to fix nitrogen, and therefore you don't have to think about nitrogen very much. And then if you're somewhere in between, of course, you have to manage as a mixed stand and think about nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Giving you a flavor for when nitrogen becomes important, say in a perennial hay stand, it's been found in Canada that yield increases and net returns increase were greater, greatest when the nitrogen was less than five pounds of N per acre and there was less than 36% alfalfa in the stand. So that's pretty specific. But what that's basically saying is if there's less than 36%, you're somewhere down in this range where it's mainly a grass stand and that's where you're gonna mainly see nitrogen benefits. Above that point, adding nitrogen probably isn't going to benefit the crop very much. So fertilizing a, a mixed stand, in this case, this was a clover stand with grasses, fertilizing with nutrients other than nitrogen will favor those legumes over the grass, which generally you wanna do. If you favor grass over legumes, the quality of your stand goes down and you're going to have to reseed it or you're going to have to spend more money on nitrogen. So what this graph is showing is a number of treatments in this study where no nitrogen was applied or nitrogen was applied. And the vertical axis shows the percent clover as dry matter. So the higher the percent clover, the more legumes remained in the stand. Notice that the percent clover was highest when no nitrogen was applied, but other nutrients were applied, like potassium and phosphorus. 
and the clover was the lowest in all of these nitrogen treatments. So you want to minimize nitrogen in a mixed legume grass stand. Any questions so far? Again, you can type these over in the, the chat box. I haven't seen any questions come through to me. Lane. Okay. I'm just going to wait a, a couple of minutes because I, or maybe 30 seconds, because I know it takes a while longer to type and longer for some of us to type uh, than, than others to say, ask a verbal question. If there are questions that pop up, I will come back to them. So let's think about if you are walking in your pasture or a hay field, hay field, what would you look for for nitrogen deficiency? And I do want to answer uh, answer this question: Does old alf stand alfalfa still fix nitrogen? So again, it would depend on how old a stand. Um, when you dig up old alfalfa um, plants, I generally still find nodules. But what makes the nitrogen fixation go down is usually an old alfalfa stand is not all alfalfa. Usually weeds and grass fill in, and so there's not as much nitrogen fixation going on. But yes, a 20, a 25 year old alfalfa plant will still uh, fix nitrogen, maybe not quite as much as when it was younger, uh, but it can still fix nitrogen. Good question. So nitrogen deficiency uh, looks like this. Lower yellow leaves, sometimes even white leaves, and darker greener leaves. And I'm asking a question, well, why the lower leaves? And the answer is that nitrogen, like five other nutrients, are is mobile in the plant. What that means is that the plant will steal from the lower leaves, take that nitrogen up to the upper leaves that are not shaded and actively growing. And so that's an advantage to the plant. Nitrogen is mobile, so it just moves it to the upper, upper area. This is what nitrogen deficiency looks like in alfalfa. It's much smaller leaves, a little bit yellow. This is what a normal, healthy alfalfa plant looks like. So if you see this, that probably means your alfalfa is not fixing nitrogen. I don't see many leaves like that because most alfalfa is fixing its own nitrogen. This orchard, this, excuse me, this pasture grass here is kind of a classic thing that I see that tells me that there's severe nitrogen deficiency. Every spot where there's dark green grass is probably where uh, some manure is or maybe some urine. And so this is a classic example that shows that we're probably nitrogen deficient. A little bit of nitrogen fertilizer would make this probably this whole pasture look dark green and tall. And also shows up as stunted or slow growth and sometimes fewer tillers in small grains. If you want to see other photos, you can go to my webpage here, Nutrient Management Module 9 has nutrient deficiency symptoms, and we have some other nutrient deficiency photos at my website shown here. And you don't have to type this out. Again, we will be sending a link uh, to all of this uh, material and to this presentation later. One thing that increasing nitrogen fertilizer generally does on grasses is it increases yield. But it also demonstrates the concept of a di diminishing return. And what that simply means is as we increase the nitrogen rate, the yield goes up, but it doesn't go up as fast at these higher rates. And so at some point, the plant just has plenty of nitrogen and you don't get any more bang for your buck. So the biggest bang for the buck is in these low areas where the plant is very nitrogen efficient. If you want to calculate your nitrogen needs for your hay ground, you're going to have to know two different things, actually three different things. The first is your yield goal. It's shown in this table here, running from one to ton, one to six tons per acre. The second in an alfalfa grass hay field, you're going to want to know your percentage of alfalfa to grass. 
And you're going to also need to know how much is in the soil. So let's give an example or do an example where we're shooting for five tons of forage. So this would be in a you know a really high production, productive environment, definitely irrigated. And let's assume we have four pounds of nitrogen per acre in the soil. It's also we're also going to assume this is a 2080 legume grass mixture. So that would be kind of typical for an older stand of alfalfa grass. Let's figure out how much fertilizer nitrogen you'd need to grow five ton. So you start with how much you need, the available nitrogen needed. You get to that by going to five tons per acre, coming over here to 2080, 20 alfalfa, 80 grass. So that tells me that you need about 100 pounds of available nitrogen per acre. Now, available nitrogen is fertilizer plus what's in the soil. So if you don't know what's in the soil, you can't know how much to add. So fertilizer N is available minus soil test. So available needed is 100 minus the four that was in the soil equals 96 pounds of nitrogen per acre would be the need. So that was for a perennial stand. What about for a, an annual forage? This is work done in Northeast Montana, looking at uh, Will Creek winter wheat and the effects of increasing available nitrogen on the wheat forage in tons per acre. And what these researchers found was kind of a classic curve where early on there's a fairly steep slope. And just like I showed with the irrigated uh, grass, as we get to higher and higher levels of available nitrogen, the tonnage really doesn't increase all that much. So if you wanted to say, if you thought you could grow three tons of Willow Creek winter wheat, you'd come over here, drop down and say, well, maybe I need about 60 pounds of nitrogen per acre. If you're optimistic, it's gonna be a wet year and you're gonna grow four ton, you'd come over here, maybe to about a hundred, you need about a hundred pounds. If you're pessimistic that it's gonna maybe be droughty, you would come over here and drop down. On average though, when I look at this whole curve, kind of in this midpoint where most producers are going to hope they're going to grow, you know, two to three to four ton, depending on moisture, the rate works out to be somewhere around 25 pounds of available nitrogen per ton forage. That was for winter wheat. Think to yourself whether you think barley would require more or less nitrogen. And my big hint with barley is it's generally quite a bit more shallow rooted than winter wheat. Winter wheat roots grow to six or seven feet, barley probably closer to about four feet. Well, in this same study, they found you need about 35 pounds of available nitrogen per ton of barley. And the reason for that is that barley simply is not going to root as deep and suck up that deeper nitrogen that we think happened in this study with winter wheat. It pulled up nitrogen from down deep, and that's why we didn't need very much uh, nitrogen at all per ton of forage. What about timing? So that was a little bit on rate. When should you apply nitrogen to hay ground? This is a graph showing as plant growth increases on the horizontal axis, the percent of maximum uptake increases, and it increases quite a bit starting somewhere around the start of the joining stage. So the green line here is biomass, the red line is nitrogen uptake. So notice that nitrogen uptake and sulfur uptake are really steep um, pretty early in the growing season. So that means that you're going to want to put down readily available nitrogen like urea or say 28 solution pretty early in the growth. Slowly available nitrogen, on the other hand, you're probably gonna to wanna to get on even earlier so it has time to become available. And I got a, a private question that was would you want to sample deeper than two feet for a winter wheat hay? And you probably would. Going back to that graph, um, 
MSU guidelines are all based on two feet of sampling, and that's because we found the best correlations around two feet. But something like winter wheat that roots deeper, you're probably missing nitrogen, and you're probably going to get a more accurate estimate of fertilizer by going deeper. So good question. Placement of nitrogen is also important for annual forage yields. This is from that same study that I just showed with winter wheat and with barley done in 2009 and 2010, tracking forage yield in tons per acre and applying two different ways. One is getting a subsurface band, so putting nitrogen below the surface in a band. The second is broad surface broadcast, applying it all on the surface. Notice that in both years, they found a yield boost by getting that nitrogen below the ground, maybe four tenths of a ton that first year. And check out the second year from 1.5 to 2.25. So three quarters of a ton of extra yield by getting that nitrogen below ground. And I'm pretty sure I know the reason for that. And that's because of volatilization, nitrogen movement to the atmosphere that happens when we broadcast and doesn't happen when the nitrogen is subsurface banded. What about splitting application? Now, this work was done in Alberta in a pretty wet environment. So, um, you know, we often in Montana get one cutting, um, sometimes two. This was a study where they actually got three cuttings. They applied their end three different ways, either once, split 50-50, or split 33, 33, 33. And then this is the yield over the zero end control. So this was, excuse me, how much more yield was obtained by applying nitrogen and then how much more was obtained by splitting the application. Notice by splitting the application, there really wasn't a very big yield boost, maybe only two tenths of a ton. So might be questionable whether it was worth it just for yield. But notice they also, the researchers, measured how much they got in each cutting. So when they just applied nitrogen once, they got a lot more in the first cutting and a lot less in the next two. When they split it 50-50, they got less in the first cutting and quite a bit more in the third cutting. So thinking about when your livestock need pay the most, this might affect whether you think it's worth splitting or not. And if they need it most later in the season when things dry out, and that's when a lot of um, hay production goes down, it might be best to split your nitrogen application. This is a study also done in Western Canada showing the effects of annual nitrogen fertilizer on dry matter yield in tons per acre for a mixed grass alfalfa stand, an alfalfa stand that was composed of one third to two thirds alfalfa, a 100% alfalfa, and 100% grass. So as you'd probably guess from now, this makes sense. As you apply more nitrogen to grass, you're going to get more yield. When you apply more nitrogen to alfalfa that can make its own nitrogen, you get no more yield and when you apply nitrogen to a mixed stand, you get slightly more yield. The thing that really stands out to me here is that notice in every nitrogen case, the mixed stand always out yielded the straight alfalfa and the straight grass. So if you're going for tonnage, which most of us are, the best stand is likely an alfalfa grass stand. Um, and it's probably because alfalfa and grass aren't competing as much for the same resources as say alfalfa is competing with itself or grass is competing with itself. Any questions on any of that? So just a review, I covered how to determine rates using MSU fertilizer guidelines, which in general call for about 25 pounds of nitrogen per acre. I covered why it's important to get nitrogen down pretty early in the growing season before that big nitrogen uptake portion. I stress that you should get nitrogen below the ground to stop volatilization. And alfalfa grass is probably gonna outcompete straight grass and alfalfa. 
Okay, so a few questions just came in. Can we substitute Clover for alfalfa in uh, these scenarios? Y you know, it would depend on type of the type of Clover. Um, the general concept, probably yes, but it's really hard to out yield alfalfa. I mean, alfalfa is just a super wonder plant. And um, so even though you can substitute the general concept, um, you're probably not going to get nearly as much yield. Um, second question is, I cannot remember where I heard this, but some workshop or seminar I attended, the speaker said that we give too much credit for legumes that although they do fix nitrogen, it isn't available for plants around the legume to use. What are your thoughts? So yeah, um, legumes are really good at scavenging nitrogen. And so they will not only fix nitrogen, they'll also use what's what's in the soil. What, um, what Tim's referencing there is sometimes there's a perception that if you're growing a mixed stand that 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 alfalfa or that sandfoin will contribute some nitrogen to the grass, but almost none of that happens. It usually works the other way. Those legumes are really good at taking up nitrogen. When you get what's called a nitrogen credit, which he asked about in that question, it's really the next year after a legume stand is terminated, it's plowed under or it's sprayed out, a lot of that nitrogen will become available uh, to the next crop. It just won't become available while the crop is growing. A uh, third question there, are there any resources that investigate forage quality due to nutrient application and timing versus only looking at yield? And there are, so like in that last, that last figure there, we know almost for sure this 100% alfalfa is going to be higher in, in protein um, than this stand or than this stand. They will also likely vary in things like um, other, well, other forage quality parameters. I am not showing them um, here though today. I was just focusing on yield. Um, certainly for, for weight gain, those quality parameters are important. I will show some effects of sulfur on protein later in this presentation. Great questions. Okay, so let's talk about nutrients other than nitrogen. Sulfur, phosphorus, and potassium. Something that's really important with all crops and also, of course, forage crops is balancing nutrients. So if you just apply, say, nitrogen, um, because you're used to nitrogen giving you a, a yield boost, sometimes you don't get any yield boost because some other nutrient is lacking. So in work done in Saskatchewan from 1992 to 2000, uh, the researchers tracked hay yield in tons per acre for no fertilizer, nitrogen alone, and then nitrogen plus sulfur. So this likely is on a pretty sulfur deficient soil, but what it is demonstrating is that nitrogen alone in a sulfur deficient environment simply is not going to increase yield. You need all the nutrients that a crop needs, including sulfur. So where would you look for sulfur deficiencies? Where we see them the most are in either eroded soils, court or coarse textured soils, and higher rainfall environments. So in Montana, there's a fair amount of sulfur deficiency right here in the Gallatin Valley because we're somewhat wetter than the rest, the rest of the state. Central Montana, because of the shallow soils, we see sulfur responses in the moccasin uh, area, so mainly Judith Basin County and Fergus County, but there's also shallow soils up in the northeast. Uh, there's shallow soils um, on the west side and northwest corner of the Golden Triangle. So there's quite a few areas that can be sulfur responsive. As I'll point out in a little bit, there's not a great soil test for sulfur. So 
Montana soils are often loadly, loaded with gypsum, calcium sulfate. Calcium sulfate dissolves in the lab, but doesn't always dissolve in the field. And so that's what because it's drier and it's colder. So that's why we think we don't see great responses to our soil sulfur test. But we do see pretty good benefits of taking tissue and having it analyzed for sulfur and then comparing that to what researchers have found to be deficient. Alfalfa specifically has been found to be deficient when sulfur concentrations are less than about 0.25%. This is by sampling leaves from the top one third of the plants right at the bud stage. One issue with sulfur, though, is that sulfur levels higher than about 0.3% can cause livestock health problems. So this is a pretty narrow range to uh, to target. We do feel that we're seeing deficiencies increasing in Montana. Um, just about five years ago, Dave Wichman at the Central Ag Research Center in Moccasin. In one study found that sulfur increased alfalfa yield about threefold in the Moccasin area. Those rocky soils there on Moccasin leach sulfate out of them, and some of them are very responsive to sulfur. So what does sulfur look like or sulfur deficiency? This is uh, sulfur on a cereal, uh, yellow, Yellow leaves, a little bit shorter than this healthy plant over here. Um, this is sulfur deficiency on alfalfa. So smaller leaves, more stunted, white to yellowish in appearance. Sometimes delayed maturity, no characteristic spots or stripes. The deficiency will generally show up on the upper leaves first and not the lower leaves first. So there was the question about forage quality. Here's a study where because sulfur is needed to make protein, just like nitrogen is needed to make protein, at three different locations in central Montana, geyser, moccasin, and more, it was found that the protein content of an alfalfa grass mixture went up by about a half percent by the addition of sulfur. So if you're feeding your forage to your own animals, this is going to um, slightly bump up probably weight gain. And this I would expect to be even more in a more sulfur deficient soil. MSU researchers have also found that adding sulfur can decrease nitrate. So nitrate is can be toxic in forages if especially pregnant animals eat too much nitrate or drink too much nitrate. Uh, it can be very toxic, make an animal sick or even kill it. So this is a study where they applied three different rates of nitrogen fertilizer, zero, 60 pounds of nitrogen per acre, and 120 pounds of nitrogen per acre. And then they tracked nitrate in percent. There's two levels shown here. This is the, this is the critical level or the maximum level for pregnant animals. This is the maximum level for non-bred animals. The black bars show no sulfur was added. The orange bars show that sulfur was added. So it looks like at no low nitrogen rates, that extra sulfur didn't matter. But at high nitrogen rates, look how high these nitrate levels are. They're toxic for non-bred animals, very toxic for pregnant animals. But the sulfur brought down the nitrate from above the toxic line for non-bred to below the toxic line. So basically the sulfur does a good job of converting some of that nitrate over to protein, and that's why sulfur can help with nitrate toxicity. This is a similar graph to what I showed before with grasses, but this graph is for alfalfa. So again, plant growth progressing on the horizontal axis percent of maximum uptake on the vertical axis. Notice by the mid vegetative stage, these lines for biomass, nitrogen uptake, and sulfur uptake are extremely steep. Meaning if you're applying nitrogen or sulfur, and in this case, we'd be more interested in sulfur because it's alfalfa, you really need to get it on quite early because the plant is taking up quite a bit of it and very quickly. 
if you wait to get your sulfur on by early bud stage, it's really too late because most of the sulfur has already been taken up, even though the plant is still putting on biomass. What about phosphorus? This is a sufficient uh, phosphorus plant with nice big nodules. This is an insufficient uh, phosphorus or a phosphorus deficient alfalfa plant. Notice essentially there's no nodules. So phosphorus helps with end fixation in the nodules. So does potassium, so does sulfur. Adding phosphorus will favor alfalfa over grass. Keep your alfalfa grass stand longer and it improves alfalfa regrowth and recovery after cutting. This is what a, a low phosphorus alfalfa leaf looks like. You'd think, well, it's darker green, but darker green can actually be an uh, indicator of phosphorus deficiency. The bigger deal here is how much smaller it is than the adequate phosphorus. Purpling is also a very classic uh, phosphorus deficiency symptom. So dark green, purple, sometimes the lower leaves might turn yellow. We sometimes see an upward tilting of leaves in alfalfa and often seen on the ridges of fields that have less available phosphorus. This is a table from the MSU fertilizer guidelines for Montana crops that shows for alfalfa, alfalfa grass and grass how much phosphorus fertilizer you need to apply for a range of Olson phosphorus levels going from zero to 16 ppm. If you're looking at a soil test for a hay field and it has more than 16 ppm, you probably have enough phosphorus. But let's say it only has eight. And let's say you're growing alfalfa grass, you probably need a fair amount of phosphorus. Moving on to potassium. Potassium helps uh, with the persistence or longevity of a stand, the number of shoots per plant. It reduces what's called leaf drop of alfalfa, improves resistance to several plant diseases, and like I mentioned, helps with nitrogen fixation. This is a great photo. I hope you can see it on your computer screen showing what was an alfalfa grass stand that had a high rate of potassium applied on the left side, no potassium or potash applied on the right hand side. And what you should see is that the left hand side still looks like an alfalfa grass stand. I can't find an alfalfa plant in the right. So by not applying potassium, what this did was a disfavored alfalfa, favored grass, which doesn't need as much potassium, whereas on this left side, that extra potassium favored the alfalfa and it stayed more as an alfalfa grass stand with alfalfa dominating. In a Manitoba study, kind of that same, that same concept, it, but it showed that potassium helped reduce winter kill. So here we have seven years the plant number in May is a percent of the previous September. So a number near 100 means no winter kill. A number near zero means 100% winter kill. Notice when they didn't apply any potassium, these brown bars, the number of plants compared to the previous year fell and fell and fell. Whereas by applying 100 pounds of potassium per acre per year, there essentially was no winter kill. Potassium deficiency sometimes looks like insect damage, little white spots on an alfalfa leaf, sometimes yellowing on the outer leaves of cereals. And potassium shows up on the lower leaves first, just like it does with nitrogen. The reason why is that potassium is also mobile in the plant. So our potassium fertilizer guidelines are set up just like phosphorus, the three crops down the right, the K soil, toil, K soil test level across the top, and then how much fertilizer to apply. So if you don't have much potassium in your soil and you're trying to grow alfalfa or alfalfa grass, you need a lot of potassium. Alfalfa is really a potassium hog. Any questions on any of that so far? So just kind of a 
a little recap, I focused mainly on sulfur, phosphorus, and potassium, what their deficiency symptoms looked like, how quickly they take up sulfur, and some of the responses of uh, sulfur specifically on alfalfa yield and quality. Any questions? I'm not seeing any on my end either, Clean. Okay. Okay. So because phosphorus and potassium, um, if you were here for the, the basic soil fertility uh, class, aren't leachable, they can actually be banked in the soil. Question that uh, Jeff asked was a lot of soils are very high in potassium. Do we still need to apply it? And so that's true in Montana. We have a lot of clay soils that tend to be high in uh, potassium. If they're, if they're very high, 400, 500, then I'd say uh, no. If they're close to that critical level, 250 parts per million, um, something to keep in mind is the best time to apply a fair amount of potassium, and this relates to banking, would be at the time of seeding. It's easier, say, to till that potassium, get it down into the soil rather than just apply it to the surface. And we've also found that because of our cold, dry conditions that often occurred, say, in early part of the growth season, a little bit of potassium fertilizer has been shown to increase uh, crop yield in Montana. Some work done in Western Canada showed that by applying a lot of phosphorus once in alfalfa, they got a similar yield, protein, and profit as that same amount divided over five annual applications. You can envision there's the hassle factor of applying phosphorus every year, and because phosphorus sticks to the surface of the soil, Probably the phosphorus you applied this year isn't going to make it to the root zone for a couple years later. So by applying a whole bunch at once it has a better chance of getting down into the root zone. So this might be a strategy to use when, say, phosphorus prices are low. Not another study done on straight grass found one large phosphorus application was the same as three smaller applications for grass yield. A little bit of seed place phosphorus and potassium can increase seedling establishment, but alfalfa is fairly and some grasses are fairly sensitive to salts at the time of seeding and fertilizer are salt. So I recommend keeping it probably below about 15 pounds of nitrogen plus potassium per acre at seeding. And maybe less than about 25 pounds of 1152 zero per acre directly with the seed and keep in mind that alfalfa is really good at a concept called luxury consumption, where it will take up more potassium than it actually needs. So that's why I recommend um, spreading out potassium fertilizer, maybe putting on some later in the season rather than all early in the season. Looking at the effects of phosphorus fertilization in Montana at two different sites, Geyser and Moore, that had relatively low phosphorus levels, uh, well less than the 16 part per million that I recommend. This was a study where they tracked four years of alfalfa grass yield in tons per acre for the control with no nutrients for a system that had 50 units of nitrogen, no phosphorus, 50 units of potassium, and 25 units of sulfur. And then this last treatment, the blue bars, was exactly the same as this, the um, maroon bars, except that there was 100 pounds of phosphorus added. Notice that that 100 pounds of phosphorus increased yield by, it looks like almost two tons per acre here, and maybe about um, a little over one ton per acre here. So that's, that's going to be profitable 
I ran some numbers just assuming $560 per ton for 11520, $150 per ton per hay, and it worked out to be about 46 bucks per acre per year of profit. We also generally see a much greater response when the soil phosphorus levels are low. So this was work done in Utah on a medium Olson phosphorus level soil and a low Olson phosphorus level soil. At no phosphorus, a half rate and a full rate tracking total alfalfa yield. So notice that this medium available phosphorus level, there was about maybe a four tenths or a half ton per acre benefit, but notice how much more benefit there was in this low phosphorus soil. So if you have a low phosphorus soil, you have a much better chance of seeing a phosphorus response. Some points with fertilizing nitrogen, fertilizing grass with nitrogen, is I would recommend that if the field is less than 75% legumes, you're going to rotate it to a different crop soon. I wouldn't worry about what I told you earlier, which was like, don't apply nitrogen to a legume. If you're rotating it out, you might as well try to boost the yield in that year, and you'll probably get a bit of a boost by uh, fertilizing that with nitrogen. If you do need to buy hay or rent pasture, the cost of hay and the cost of renting pasture, my numbers indicate it's probably less costly to fertilize your own hay than buy somebody else's hay. The other thing is nitrogen can increase yields for many years. So this is a graph done on work up in Haver from 1972 to 1977, where they applied two different rates of nitrogen fertilizer just once. So they applied 50 pounds of nitrogen per acre in 72, and they applied 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Then they tracked the cumulative increase over the no nitrogen control. And to my surprise, they continued to see yield boosts up to about six years later. I would have bet they would have seen one year benefit and then that nitrogen would have leached, volatilized, been taken up by microbes. This tells me that enough nitrogen stayed in the soil or maybe got released from those microbes or from the residue that there were benefits for an extended period of time. And the total benefit was about 1.4 ton per acre by applying 50 pounds of N per acre just once. So in conclusion, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and sulfur can all produce growth responses in forage. Economic benefits often aren't realized in the first year like I just showed you, so don't always base your decisions just on one-year studies. And soil te testing, as I hopefully showed you by looking at those tables, is completely essential for determining your, your hay grounds fertilizer needs. If you want more information on forage uh, fertility, you can go to two different web pages. One would be uh, this one where we have all of our publications listed. You can find, for example, uh, this extension bulletin on phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, and micronutrient effects on forages and management, and nitrogen management for forages. Or you can also go to this web page here that has our two-page soil scoops for those of you that would prefer not to read these eight and 12-page documents, but really get to the point with just a two-page document. So with that, I would like to thank you and take any questions that you have. So again, wrapping up there, I showed some of the benefits of phosphorus, potassium, and nitrogen on forage yields. Any questions on any of that? And thank you, Emily, for putting um, the direct link in since you probably can't click on that um, on your screen. Thanks, Jane, for welcoming 
pays. So Dwight asks, what is the benefit of uh, Sanfoin? So the benefit of Sanfoin is it's, it's, it's a non-bloat legume. So alfalfa fed at the wrong time to the wrong animal uh, can result in bloat, which can be um, fatal to some animals and make others quite sick. It causes them to basically blow up. Um, Sanfoin does not, and that's, I think, one of the reasons it's getting increased interest in uh, Montana. Another question was, can soil moisture and temperature uh, tie up nitrogen? So, not by themselves. So, increased soil moisture and increased temperature will cause soil organic matter to break down more quickly because those are two things that microbes like, warmth and moisture. So it'll actually warm temperatures, more moisture will release uh, nitrogen. Um, dry and cold will make that nitrogen not move as fast and will make the soil organic matter not break down as fast. But I wouldn't say by themselves they can really tie up nitrogen. We've had perennial grasses that have had what looked like they died or were burned on the tips after the first cutting. What could cause that? So that's one of those uh, million dollar questions. Um, what generally causes burning is too much nitrogen, but often perennials are not, you know, fertilized that aggressively. It could be could be burn, um, especially if around the first cutting is when you see your first uh, major drought. But I really am hesitant to try to diagnose based on just that. I would encourage you to talk to your extension agent who can help you send in a plant next time, dig up the roots, uh, send the whole plant into the Scudder Diagnostic Lab. It could be a root rot, um, it could be a, a disease, and it could be related to fertility and we'll do our best to answer that question. So just a reminder, the future sessions that are coming up include sustainable nutrient management on February 10th. Uh, this is a, an incorrect date here, not February 13th, but February 17th, which is a Wednesday, uh, will be on cover crops. Then asked, is fertilizing in the fall beneficial? So, yes, for the less mobile nutrients. So, applying phosphorus and potassium in the fall gives them a little more time to get down to the plant roots. Fertilizing with nitrogen in the fall has the risk of loss over the winter. So, either from leaching, if it's a wet uh, fall, winter, early spring, also tie up by microbes. And so I generally would not recommend uh, nitrogen fertilization in the fall, just from a, a risk uh, perspective. Any other questions? All right, well, with that, I'm going to uh, wrap up. I'm going to um, stop my recording and I want to thank everybody for all of your great questions and I hope to see you uh, maybe one of the next two Wednesdays.